So I will tell you, or offer to you today, that we are here physically tonight because of Mahomes' failure, which is influential. Now, if he succeeded, the, the, his headquarters was Petersburg or Norfolk, and that's where all of this would have been. This would have been something else. We'd have been someplace else. I think you could argue with that. Um, because of dealing with state government and politicians and things like that, Mahone's become well known in the state capital. So it's not a long stretch for him to go from railroad man to politician. And the, the issue that galvanizes him is the state debt, um, which is, I'll try to explain fairly simply so I can understand it. Um, this has a lot to do with those investments that the state made in these very expensive capital projects. The railroads, the, the, the canals, the highways, and things like that. And during the Civil War, those things are damaged, and perhaps even destroyed. Plus, there's five years where the interest compounds. And once the war is over, the bondholders, they're right on top of it. They want to be repaid. And some of these bondholders are Virginians. And, and there comes this controversy about what's the obligation to repay their debt, which is crushing. It's like $33 million. Also, the severance of West Virginia exacerbates it, too, because that's a much less taxable real estate that they can generate revenue from. Um, this get the rise of the readjuster party, the so-called readjuster party. The competing interest after the war is that lots of people want more social services. They want public schools, which have never existed before. They want um, more government presence. Also, you've got this, this enormous population of recently franchised African Americans who have their own concerns and desires too. And they've got nothing. And they don't feel like paying off the debt because their argument is, hey, we paid it with our sweat and you gave us nothing. Um, and, and this becomes a, a very polarizing issue. Um, there is a group of people in the state largely located in the northern Shenandoah Valley, far southwest Virginia, and south side that are, that are against paying the debt in full and say we need to negotiate it downward because we're simply not going to be able to do this without bankrupting ourselves. The other people, the so-called funders, are saying, look, we got it made. You people you always had to fend for yourself. You're going to have to keep fending for yourself. It's a matter of honor. We can't take the money out of our limited state budget and give it to public schools, for example, because we don't have it to give. And this becomes really the divisive issue of the era. Now, Mahone, after his railroad interest has gone away and he's got time to spend, I suppose, gets involved with the readjuster party and becomes the leading figure in the readjuster party, becomes the organizer. Um, runs a campaign, of, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, seeks nomination of governor at a convention in 1897, but fails to get it, but yet becomes basically the boss, the mastermind of the party. He finds that, he, that his mental acuity extends to political organizing. He becomes really good at this. Organizing people down to the precinct level, sending people out, communicating with people, getting people on your side meeting with people, talking to them. He's just a great emulsifier of, of, of interest. And, and that is so successful that the Readjuster Party, with the help of a, a night, the 13 African Americans elected to the legislature, take control of the General Assembly for a couple of years. Now this is by far and away the most successful biracial political party in the South post-Civil War. Other southern states tried it, didn't work. Readjusters actually control the state house, and then they elect a governor in 1881. So their program is enacted rapidly. They readjust the debt, um, they fund public education, they also offer their black voters, who end up being pivotal, um, the end of the whipping post, the end of poll taxes, um, a new 
institution, an industrial institution that becomes Virginia State University. Um, mental health facilities for whites and blacks, separate. Um, and this succeeds so wildly popular, it, it's so popular and so successful, it goes out of business. Everybody loves it, there's no more issue. In it. <laughs> so the people that were all hot and bothered about this sort of start drifting back to their natural political coalitions. The status quo starts <coughs> redeveloping. But um, Mahone, seeing the possibilities of having an independent party and also having an insurgent party that is against the best people, as you would say, the, the, the FFVs, the traditional power structure, the Tidewater aristocracy, you know, all of that stuff. Um, doesn't want to give up, doesn't want to relent. And so he starts uh, an effort to try to affiliate with the National Republican Party, which is the only thing that he can figure out as, as sort of a lifeline to uh, continued existence of the readjusters. And the readjusters become Republicans which is really problematic for a number of reasons. First of all, because the Republicans are the party of Lincoln and abolition, and they're the guys that shot, you know, your brother, John. Um, secondly, an important part of the coalition is the black electorate. And, you know, people are still very, very, very sensitive about ceding any sort of social control or, or stake to and Mahone's got a lot of enemies um, from his railroad days, throwing sharp elbows, trying to combat the northern interest. So it, it, it becomes difficult to get a Republican Party established in the state of Virginia. You have this series of Republican presidents in Washington that they go through kaleidoscopically uh, that have different approaches toward whether they're going to be receptive to Mahone and his efforts down. You have Hayes, you have Garfield, he didn't last very long. You have <laughs> Arthur, you have Harrison, you know, and they've all got different sort of angles on it. But nobody's really wants to put the time and effort and resources into nurturing a Republican Party in the state of Virginia. Mahone does get elected Senator and serves a term in the U.S. Senate because the legislature elected senators in those days. And he comes in the Senate at a really interesting time because they've got a split. They're even Stephen, and Mahone decides that he's going to caucus with the Republicans. And so as a plum for that decision, could have gone either way, they give him some really important committee chairmanships. And they also give him control of patronage. And control of patronage is, is the lifeblood of political control in those states because you have federal jobs, you have state jobs, and if you can give, you know, your cousin um, you know, Leroy, a job, then he's beholden to. You. And that's how the Republicans keep a tiny toehold, although they're basically swept out of office a couple of years later. Um, and for good, one of the pivotal incidents that happens with that is um, the so called Danville riot of, of 1883, 1884, I'm not sure which one. What happens is they're having a Democratic regional convention in Danville, and there's some kind of tussle outside of it. There's always public spaces are always involved in tussles. Transportation, <laughs> sidewalks, roads, something like that. You know, when the races come together, uh, there's potential for trouble, and there's gunfire, and as usual, more blacks get killed than whites. But um, still, um, this, this becomes a crystalline in the opposition's mind about the potential for some kind of big racial shift. And they put out this position paper called the Danville Circular, which goes in the newspapers all over the states. One of the most uh, effective political, um, I don't know what you'd call it these days, you know, statements, uh, campaign ads or something like that. And it talks about, it's from the people of Danville and how they're in trouble. and. And the city government has black people in the police department and on city government now, and there are black people who are serving on school boards. And what happens if, if um, you know, the black teacher spanks your little girls who are in for being bad? And, you know, just, just the most visceral stuff that you can think of. 
And in that election, you know, it, it, it sweeps the readjusters out of office. And, and they don't come back after that because this conservative party is then renamed the Democratic Party. And they realize that what they got going for them is not only more resources, but the race issue. Now, this all happens in this period of time that's sort of a historiographic desert. Because if you go to the library, any, even a college library, they'll jump from the end of Reconstruction, the removal of, of military leadership in 1860, 1876, 1877, right to Plessy versus Ferguson in the early 1890s uh, and in and, and the Jim Crow era. But there's 20 years almost, or 15 in there. It's a very, very influential period. Um, there's not a lot written about this period of time, but I want to recommend this book, which you probably have to order. It's called Before Jim Crow, The Politics of Race in Post-Emancipation Virginia by Jane Daly. And it's very, very good. It's a little bit of a mini biography of Mahone, but it talks in detail about this period of time in the state when these parties are jockeying for position, and the outcome's not at all sure as to what the future of Virginia's going to look about, or going to look like, but how it came to develop. And what happens is that with the political control restored to the status quo, they begin to harden these uh, social attitudes into laws. And um, this is the lead up to the turn of the century constitutional conventions that are called in Virginia across the South to rewrite the state constitution passed after or during Reconstruction to impose the profound voting restrictions that cut the electorate by a third, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, all of that stuff, specifically designed to reduce black voting. Now, Mahone's not completely done at that point, but he runs for governor unsuccessfully in 1889 and loses. And after that, um, he lives for another seven years, moves to Washington, D.C., uh, manages his interests. But he's gone, but he's not forgotten. Because, um, you know, those of us of a certain age that are here remember how things used to be in the state. And you remember Harry Byrd. And you remember when, when we had a single political party that pretty much dominated the state here. And I think that there's a direct line between the reaction to or against Mahone and readjusterism and that biracial party to the world that we lived in and the state lived in through the first half of the 20th century. And particularly here in Virginia because, you know, nothing was more airtight than political control than Harry Byrd. And, and that was strictly based on self-interest. You know, they were, they were scrupulous, but they were also involved with self-interest, and it also relied on a limited electorate. And that didn't change until the state changed. And what changed was the growth of the Washington suburbs, the growth of the military force in Eastern Virginia, the growth of mass media, um, and the Civil Rights Act. So the Civil Rights Act, the mid-60s that did away with these voting restrictions was, I would say, if not in direct response, indirect response to what they used to call Mahonism. Oh. As if um, there was something malignant about that. Mahone, and, and the other thing that happens to him too is that he basically gets expunged from the record. You know, when you read those Virginia history books that we had when we were kids, you know, they go from Gettysburg the smoke clears at Gettysburg. You're there at Appomattox. That's sad. And then all of a sudden, you're talking about Admiral Byrd or the Spanish-American War or something like that. You know, there's nothing. I saw a textbook um, written by some dowager that was a public textbook for kids around the turn of the century or maybe a little bit later than that. It had the following statement. Between the years 1870 and 1900, Nothing of interest happened in the state of Virginia. <laughs> now, and, and a lot of stuff that you read about Mahone, even what little bit there is out there, is always tinged with, with his enemies' opinions.
because they think they accuse him of corruption, which they were guilty of also. You know, in those days, there's, there's no civil service stuff, there's no campaign finance stuff. You applied politicians, you didn't, you didn't talk to them. And so he did that, the other side did that. They, uh, you know, it, it's always about what a malignant force he was and how <laughs> we're not going to do this again. We're not going back to these days. The, uh, these historical societies that got formed right around the turn of the century, the Association for Preservation of Virginia Historic Sites, being one of them, was specifically formed by Mahone enemies. And it was like, we're not going we're gonna to talk about connections to the old country, to our Anglo Saxon past specifically. And, and, and that's why they did Jamestown. And that's why the impetus of Williamsburg is now. You know, Virginia history is still dominated by Eastern Virginia and colonial history. You know, if you get the Virginia Magazine, the history and biography, every issue you can count on is that somebody's written another book about Williamsburg or Jefferson or Washington, like, which is fine. But, you know, you look on the board of directors of that outfit, they've got William Fraley on it, and he's the only guy from west of the Blue Ridge. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is happening, people, still. <laughs> and, um, I, the, 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 you know, before, I'll, I'll wrap up and take questions here, but the most telling thing that um, I've heard on a personal level, so I've got a, a buddy um, who's a contemporary, who's a, a physician in Petersburg, and um, he said he had a nanny that told him that he misbehaved. The ghost of General Mahone was going to come get him. <laughs> <laughs> so you can bet I'm using that. <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 overall here, I just think this is, a, it, the, here it is in and of itself a fascinating light, but it's also an interesting study about how things are remembered, how stories are told, what gets emphasized, what isn't emphasized, how you can manipulate history in the past, <laughs> to meet the present or your vision of the future. And lo and behold, things haven't changed. Much, you know? It's still true to a greater or lesser degree. I don't know that there's another po political coalition anymore that you could uh, compare to the readjustments. But still, this whole challenge of the status quo, um, um, resistant to change populism, um, you know, political rhetoric, interests in ethnicity, it's, we're living, basically. So I just offer that here's a man for our times. Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Where was, what was his residence when uh, he was uh, elected to the Senate? I think Petersburg. As a matter of fact, his, he, his, he lived in the house that became the public library just recently replaced. But he also lived in Lynchburg. You see, he's got correspondence from Lynchburg. And, and he lived in Norfolk for a while. I think he moved the family around where the business interest dictated, but all, always somewhere along the road. OK, someone, oh yeah, you, you, you said you had a question. Has your research turned up anything about a, a little tidbit I remember from years ago about a midnight drive that he made to Lexington? That's somebody else, okay. right? Well, who's the other guy? He's a, it's a famous name around. Moomaw. Moomaw's a Moomaw. Oh, okay, thank you. No, because see, he, Mahone, um, he resisted the Shenandoah Valley line because that's one of these north-south things, and the northern uh, railroad interests were behind him. And it didn't get done, you notice, until the northern guys bought the NW. But there was some fallout from that, too, because he lost political support in Shenandoah Valley because he wouldn't uh, support building the railroad. He had that strong support in the northern Shenandoah Valley, and that went away. And Augusta County becomes one of the headquarters of anti mahomes <laughs> The Stanton area, any number of people, you know, with that connection to the railroad north and south there. So, no. Um, that all, had Mahone held on to the railroad, uh, you know, I guess they, sooner or later they'd gotten a line down here in the Roanoke, but it might not have intersected where it intersected, and we might not be here. So, anybody else?
Can you speak just for a second how in his life it seems to be this thread of everything he experiences at different phases comes to help him later. And one of the things that I like about his Civil War successes is that he's playing on his earlier railroad experience. I know there's at least one battle uh, that where he, he, he helps his cause with a, a hidden cut that he's able to move troops through That's in order to reposition. Right, because he knows the road network having worked on that road network there too. And also, the, one of the ways that he intimidated the Union troops that were getting ready to take over the Norfolk Navy Yard was he goes, okay, run those trains back up and forth, back and forth, make a lot of noise, blow the whistle, <laughs> make it sound like you're getting reinforced. And that worked, apparently. See, you know, he, 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 he would make a great modern corporate CEO. But one of the other reasons for his demise, too, and I should have mentioned this, was he's not, it's his way of the highway. He, he, he's not really good at nurturing acolytes. People come on board and then fall away because they get tired of doing what he wants them to do. So he's, he's a little too powerful for his own good, and that may have contributed to his lack of success of organizing the Republican Party in the state, but I don't think that's the whole reason. Anybody else? I'm sorry I kept everybody here for a really long time. I'm really good. I apologize.